Hi, well, it's great to be here. And thank you to Peg and the series and to new friends met here. So this is very exciting. Uh, I'm in the weird position of having two books come out very close together. So I'm going to give you a little sample from each. Uh, they are linked in that they both have a connection to Appalachia, which is where I'm from and uh, worked for many years as a journalist. So um, the voice in the first one, uh, Leopard Lady, is a novel in verse. And she's born in Kentucky, orphaned in the Depression. And this is her spiritual um, and physical journey in a mid-century carnival uh, through a number of roles and, and, and identities. So I'm just going to read a couple of poems from this book since I seem to be the only poet here tonight. <laughs> and in keeping with the uh, wilderness theme, both of these have some connection to wilderness. The leopard lady tells her spots. Don't be looking for what's dogged on that banner. The leopard lady naked in the jungle, brown skin all over with black spots like wallpaper on a wall. I'm more so like to a spotted hound or the rump of the Appaloosie our trick rider uses. White strode over dark, but truly like the banner says, I am alive. Inside the tent, I rest on a high stool, wrapped in red, till the professor brings them round and spills a story that ain't mine. I keep my back to the crowd, but they spy my hands spotted like trout fish resting on my shoulders. I hear them rustle and breathe, and I let the silk slide down. Nothing there, one says out. My back is perfect brown, set for a patch on my backbone just above the spangly girdle I wear for modesty, but it scares that. The silk, you're whispering louder than them as the kimono falls and I turn and stand. They see me top to toe, all over speckled, face to breast to ankles, my affliction being such that where one side is marked, so will be the other. Here I am. Then the light dims down and the crowd shuffles along to see the terrible snake man of the Amazon and I gather up my red to cover my nakedness. Uh, I went to Coney Island to investigate this voice that came to me. And so I actually painted the banner while I was there and went to the sideshow and worked with some of the sideshow people. And so this is mid-century. This is when sideshows still had so-called freaks. Uh, Dinah's a really smart lady and makes her way in the world. This is all uh, in her voice, or most of it. Uh, and this is one of her other uh, observations. You don't leave it on the side of the road. Only the skunk who is precious in the sight of the Almighty for his first fingers marked its back like you'd stroke a cat's. That piss kitty just humping across the road headed for what egg breaking or cricket hunting it does in the night. When the tire finds it and the wheel, the bump too small to be a body broken, but it was, raises up a smell from earth to heaven like a mortal soul clinched for the longest time to the ankle of its death. So Dinah's story takes her from rural Kentucky to Coney Island at the end of the book. And we're going to leave her there. And uh, I'm going to give you just a little sample from my latest book, uh, which is To the Bones, which is a literary genre-bending novel with bits of horror, mystery, Appalachian tall tales, satire, taking on the coal industry and its depredations on people in that part of the world. So in the opening of the book, a, uh, a man gets off the highway in the wrong place, sort of a traditional horror trope that I'm working with. And so I'll read just a little piece of that. The last thing he remembered, he'd been driving. Two-lane road, the trees so close, an inky tunnel pierced by his headlights. Maybe the car went off the road. Maybe you're buried, his unpleasant thoughts mocked. There was a faint lessening of the gloom ahead. He kept crawling, <coughs> sticks rolling under his hand. Something chitinous and leggy moved across his fingers. 
He pulled his hand away, then put it back down. The thin gray light increased. He could see that, if not much else, with his glasses gone and his shoes gone, the toes of his socks dragging across damp rocks. He seemed to hear things breathing nearby, waiting. No one's coming back for you, ever. He crawled around a ragged corner and the light became a crack in the sky, a white intensity that squeezed shut his eyes and made the back of his head spasm in pain. He opened his eyes just enough to see a hazy field of rocks and debris. He picked up a large round object and brought it close to his weak eyes. A pair of empty eye holes stared back. He flung the skull away, hearing it crack, and rolled to a stop when he realized the rocks and sticks were bones and that he was among the dead. So Derek, um, the civil servant, mild-mannered sort, finds out there's a lot wrong in Carbon County, a river that's been turned bright orange with mine acid, people are gone missing, uh, but a few aren't willing to let the local coal barons really run things for the land and people. He crawls out of the mine crack. When I lived in Appalachia, I had a farm, and we had a crack in the back where the mine was. And I used to say, if I'm going to kill somebody, I'm going to throw them down a mine crack, because no one's ever going to find them. So he manages to get out of the mine crack, and he stumbles into town and into a sweepstakes parlor where he meets uh, Lorana Taylor. And she's moved back there to find her daughter, who's gone missing. She takes in this stinking, vile, bloodied man because he found something that might be a clue to what happened to her daughter. And uh, at first, that seems like, well, maybe that's not a bad idea because she, he might be able to help her. However... On the way to her house, uh, what happened to him in the uh, mine crack uh, becomes evident because it turns out he's rather lethal. So she's now got this, this smelly man in her home who can kill people. So what does she do with this? Um, and I lost my page, shame on me. But she goes to Walmart in the middle of the night to get some clothes because he stinks and he doesn't have any shoes. And while she's there, people talk to her about the zombie. The zombie has been seen staggering down the road, covered with blood. And you know, where there's one zombie, there's probably others. Um, so she has a little discussion uh, about that with a woman who comes to the sweepstakes. He was seen on Fish Camp Road, Helen says, staggering along, all bloody. The road a heaver saw him, the whole car load of Oh, Helen, really. Lorana reached out and touched her arm. Next thing you'll say, there's UFOs. You go ahead and mock that this is the real deal. Head bashed in, walking all stiff-like. They hightailed it out of there, Missy and Buster and her kids, and called the police. But of course they laughed at him. Until poor Jimmy Cooper. That zombie killed Jimmy, sucked the blood right out of his body. That would be a vampire. <laughs> Lorana couldn't help herself. But all the time her mind was racing about what happened and who might have seen Derek on the road. Well, maybe it's a vampire. They don't come out in the daylight, do they? Anyway, zombies eat brains. <laughs> so the book has some very dark humor in it, but there is some humor. Um, and I'm going to read just a very quick piece out of... Um, Along with the, uh, the zombie panic, which, which starts, people start wondering, is this, is this the rapture? People are being raised. So there's a, a meeting at the river. The question is, is it to pray the zombies away or to make the rapture come? It's not entirely clear. Um, but another member of the little group that's fighting the Kavanaugh coal barons uh, is at the river. And he is uh, a disgraced deputy who lost his his job for asking too many questions. The whole thing gave him the willies. Looking at the fouled river, thinking about what lay at the bottom of a mine crack, he imagined the rotting bodies rising from the dark, flesh coming back on the bones, eyes returning to the sockets of the skull. The preacher finished his rant and stepped away from the pulpit, mopping the sweat from his bald head, then pulling a mountaineer stocking cap from his back pocket to protect it from the cold. 
this young woman moves forward and sings, and then Marco saw the pier move and thought it was an illusion. He blinked to clear his head. The pier shuddered. The crowd began to mill, pressing forward as those on the pier began to move toward the shore. Then the whole structure shifted to the right, twisted abruptly, tipped up one side down on the other. It happened fast. It seemed like slow motion. The ping of rivets parting, screech of metal scraping against metal, and the people fell and slid, screaming men and women and instruments, all moving in a tangled mass toward the river. The choir fell in a flurry of satin, blue and black and red. People caught on the shifting deck, clawed to stay there, desperately scrabbling with heels and elbows, but slipping under the ornamental railing or out through the gaps. The pier rotated on its remaining legs, throwing new souls into the water who thought they had been spared. Those on land had fallen to their knees and were praying. A lot of fucking good that does, Marco thought. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>